Jai Swami Narayan. Today we are starting a new section in the Bachana Amrut since we finished the Sorangpur section last time. Here we are beginning with Haryani 1, a worm and a bee. On Bahadarva Sudhi the 12th, Sambat 1877, or the 19th of September 1820, a decorated canopied cot that had been brought by Jadavji, a devotee from Surat, had been placed on the veranda outside the north-facing rooms of Vastak Hachar's Darbar in Haryani. A mattress upon, sorry, a mattress with a white silken cover had been placed upon that cot. A white cylindrical cushion and red silken knee cushions had been placed on top of the cushion. Oh, how comfy! Also, frills of golden fabric were dangling on all four sides of the cot. Sriji Maharaj was sitting facing north on this beautifully decorated cot. He was wearing a black-bordered white case and had tied a golden-bordered white peto around his head. He had also covered himself with a golden-bordered shelu. At that time, an assembly of munis, scholars, as well as devotees from various places had gathered before him. They were all enjoying the darshan, the sight of Sriji Maharaj, and were captivated by his charming appearance. I would be too from the sounds of it. Then Sriji Maharaj said to the Paramahansas, the great monks, please ask and answer questions amongst yourselves. Oh, you know when the Paramahansas gather, we're going deep. <laughs> Thereupon, Buddharanand Swami asked, Does the conviction of God arise in the Anthakaran, the inner mental faculties associated with the Sukshuma, the subtle body, or in the Jiva, the soul, which is compared to the causal body? Shivanand Swami attempted to answer the question, but was unable to do so satisfactorily. So, Sriji Maharaj said, The jiva knows through the buddhi, the intellect, one of the four anthakarans, which is the cause of all knowledge and is greater than all. That buddhi resides in the man, the mind, in the chit, the consciousness, in the ahangar, the ego, which are the other three anthakarans, in the ears, in the eyes, in the nose, in the tongue. These are the Gyanendriyas, uh, the organs of, of perception. In the mouth, in the skin, in the arms, in the legs, and the organs of procreation and excretion. These are the Karmendriyas, the organs of locomotion. It resides in the body in this manner, pervading it from head to toe. The jiva, the soul, resides within this buddhi. But the jiva is not felt, only the buddhi is felt. The following example will illustrate this. When the flames of a fire rise and fall, they do so because of the wind. They rise and fall. The rise and fall of the flames are apparent, but the wind is not apparent. Also, when dung is placed in fire and the dung begins to burn, then... When it is placed where there is no wind, smoke begins to rise. At that time, the rising smoke is apparent, but the wind within it is not. Also, the clouds that move in the sky are seen to do so because of the wind, but the wind that resides within them is not apparent. In this way, flames, smoke, and the clouds represent the buddhi, and the wind represents the jiva as the causal force. What is that jiva like? Well, it is the knower of the convictions formed by the buddhi. It also knows brahma, the, uh, the faculty of, of creation. The cause of the convictions in the buddhi, it perceives the thoughts of the man, the mind, and also perceives chandra, the moon, which symbolizes the mind. Um as it has an attracting force on the waters of the world. This is in parallel to Surya, sun, which is symbolized as the jitta, the consciousness which illumines 
the very moon. Speaking of which, it perceives the contemplation of the citta, the consciousness, and also perceives Vasudev, uh, the all-pervading faculty of maintenance, the cause of the contemplation in the citta. It perceives the I-ness of the ahankar, the ego, and also perceives rudra, the faculty of dissolution, the cause of that I-ness. In this manner, the jiva perceives the four andhakarans, the ten indriyas, their vishais, their objects of experience, and the presiding devas, who allow one to discriminate among those vishais. Moreover, it does all of this simultaneously. That jiva appears to be in one place. It appears to be as fine as the tip of a spear, and it appears to be extremely subtle, like one point of awareness, a singular point of awareness, which illuminates all of these experiences. It appears so because it is associated with the buddhi. But when that jiva is known as the illuminator of the body, indriyas and hakaran, their presiding devas and the vishais, it appears to be extremely vast and it appears to be pervasive. That is when it is not associated with the buddhi. The jiva is known not by the indriyas, but by inference. For example, on seeing a sword weighing ten mounds, a person can infer the wielder of this sword must be extremely strong. Similarly, the jiva inspires the body, indriyas, etc., simultaneously. Therefore, it must be very powerful. This is how the jiva can be known by inference. Sriji Maharaj answered the question in this manner. Nityanand Swami then asked, Maharaj, what is the answer to the original question in what you have just said? Sriji Maharaj clarified, Well, the answer is that when the conviction of God has developed in the buddhi, one should realize that that conviction has also developed within the jiva. How does that happen? Well, the conviction initially develops in the indriyas, in the sense organs, then in the ahangar, the ego, then in the chit, the consciousness, then in the man, the mind, then in the buddhi, the intellect, and then finally it develops in the jiva. So, Riji Maharaj replied in this manner, Again, Nityanand Swami asked, Maharaj, how can one know when there is conviction of God in the Indriyas? How can one know when there is conviction of God in the Andhakaran, the inner mental faculties? And how can one know when there is conviction of God within the Jiva, the soul? Sriji Maharaj replied, The conviction of God which is in the Indriyas should be known as follows. Of all the objects in this world which are seen, heard, smelt, or touched, some are pleasant and some give misery, some are liked and some are disliked, some are appropriate and some are inappropriate. If no doubts arise, even when all of these aspects are apparent in God, that should be known to be the conviction of God in the Indriyas. I believe that is to say, despite the variety of seemingly contradictory objects of our experience, if we realize God to be imminent within all of these spectrums of duality, and God is said to be realized in the indriyas, in the senses. That is my opinion. Further, of the various effects of the three gunas, the qualities of sattva gun, quality of goodness, purity, rajogun, the quality of passion, activity, and tamogun, the quality of darkness and ignorance. The effect of tamogun is laziness, sleep, etc. The effect of rajogun is lust, anger, etc. And the effect of sattva gun is tranquility, self-restraint, etc. 
If no doubts arise, even when all of these are noticed in God, then that should be known as the conviction of God in the antakaran, the inner mental faculties. Due to nirvikalpa samadhi, Rushabdev Bhagwan wandered eccentrically, keeping a stone in his mouth. Although his body burned in a forest fire, he remained totally unaware of it. So, if no doubts arise when such a gunatit, a qualityless state beyond the gunas, is apparent in God, then that should be known as conviction of God in the jiva. The souls. For example, ships which travel in the sea carry an iron anchor with them. When thrown into the sea, if that anchor is immediately retracted before it reaches the seabed, then not much effort is required. It comes out immediately. However, if it is allowed to reach the seabed before it is retracted, then it comes out only after much effort. But if it is allowed to descend gradually, and it settles and lodges itself into the seabed, then it cannot be pulled up by any means. It cannot be retracted. Similarly, when a person develops the conviction of God in their jiva, that conviction cannot be dislodged in any way whatsoever. In this way, Sri Ji Maharaj spoke at length, but only a small portion has been mentioned here. Then, Chaitanya Nan Swami asked, Maharaj, God is beyond the mind and speech. He is gunatit, without qualities. How then can the mayak indriyas and anthakaran perceive him? Sri Maharaj replied, When the jiva, the knower of the body, indriyas and anthakaran, becomes eclipsed during the state of deep sleep, its indriyas and anthakaran also become eclipsed in that deep sleep. At that time, God inspires that jiva. When the jiva enters the dream state from the state of deep sleep, the dream-related locations, pleasures, vishais, and the jiva are all inspired by God. He inspires them during the waking state as well. In this way, God inspires the jiva both when it is conscious of the body and when it is not. Furthermore, from Pradhan, Mahatattva was formed, this uh, primordial element forming universal consciousness. From Mahatattva, the three types of Ahankar, egoity, were formed. From that Ahankar, the Indriyas, the Senses, devas, five bhuts, elements, five tanmatras were formed, which are uh, various kinds of bodies, I believe. All of those were inspired by God. Verat, who is composed of all these elements, the cosmic being, who is, uh, is also inspired by God. When all of these merge into maya, material existence, then God inspires that maya as well. That God inspires both jiva and Ishvar. Ishvar refers to a um, kind of a divinity, like God, but maybe with a lowercase g. You could say the, a lord of the universe. Not quite the ultimate reality, but certainly up there. That God inspires both Jiva and Ishvar when they identify themselves with their bodies. He inspires both Jiva and Ishvar even when they reside in the state of deep sleep and are eclipsed by Pradhan and are without any identity or form. He inspires Kal, time, which causes Maya, material existence, and other entities to assume an identity and form and also causes them to forsake identity and form. So, how can that God be known by the Indriyas and Andhakaran? Is that your question? Everyone confirmed, Yes, Maharaj, that is the question. So, Sriji Maharaj continued, The answer to that is as follows. God does not create and sustain the world for his own sake. 
In fact, it is said in the Srimad Bhagavat, Pudhindriya Sorry. Pudhindriya manah pratnam jananam asturjat prabhuhu matrartham cha bhavartham cha yatmane kalpanaya cha which is from the 10th Cantor, 87th chapter, 2nd verse to the Srimad Bhagavat. Forgive me for my Sanskrit. This verse means, God created the buddhi, the intellect, indriyas, the senses, man, mind, and brans, the vital forces of the body, of all people to enable the jivas, the causal soul, to indulge in the vishais, the experiences of the senses, to take birth, to transmigrate to other realms, and to attain liberation. Therefore, God created this cosmos for the sake of the jivas, liberation. God sustains it for the sake of the jivas, liberation. In fact, God also causes its dissolution for the sake of the jivas, liberation. How is that? Well, he destroys it to allow the jivas, tired as a result of undergoing many births and deaths, to rest. That God who acts in all ways for the benefit of jivas becomes like a human out of compassion. Then, when the jivas maintain profound association with the sant, the saint of that God, why should they not be able to know him? They certainly can know him. Thereupon, Bhajananand Swami asked, Why then, Maharaj, does the Vedic verse claim, Yato vacho nivartante aprapya manasa saha? From where speech returns along with the mind without having attained Brahman? From the second canto, fourth chapter, first verse of the Taitriya Upanishad. Riji Maharaj replied in a pleased tone, Well, in that case, the facts are as follows. Prithvi, earth, resides in Akash, space, but does not become like Akash. Jal, water, also resides in Akash, but does not become like Akash. Dej, fire, also resides in Akash, but does not become like Akash. And Vayu, air, also resides in Akash, but does not become like Akash. In the same way, the mind and speech do not attain God. Then, Nityanand Swami raised the doubt. Maharaj, the Shrutis and Smritis, that which is heard and that which is remembered, the scriptures. The oral tradition claim Niranjanaha Paramam Samyam Upaiti, which is from the third canto, third chapter, first verse of the Mundaka Upanishad. One who is free from the blemishes of Maya, material existence, attains qualities similar to those of the Supreme Being, i.e., God. Sriji Maharaj then said, What I just mentioned is regarding the mind and the indriyas of non-devotees. The mind and indriyas of devotees of God, however, do attain God-realization. For example, at the time of dissolution, Prithvi, which resides in Akash, becomes one with Akash. Jal also becomes one with Akash, Tej also becomes one with Akash, and Vayu also become one with Akash. Oh, my apologies. Nityananda Swami also mentioned another verse from the fourth chapter, tenth verse of the Bhagavad Gita. Bhavodhyana tapasa uta madbhavam agataha Which means many who have been purified by austerities in the form of jnan, knowledge, have attained my qualities. Very similar to the other verse. 
Similarly, the bodies, indriyas, andhakarans, and prans of those who are devotees of God, due to their jnana of God, become like God. This is because God's form is itself divine. So the bodies, indriyas, and andhakarans of those devotees become like God's indriyas, andhakaran, and body. That is why those devotees' bodies, indriyas, andhakarans, and prans become divine. The following example will clarify. A bee captures a worm, stings it, and then buzzes over it. As a result, that worm, in the very same body, is transformed into a bee. Thereafter, none of its bodily parts remain like that of a worm. It becomes exactly like a bee. Similarly, a devotee of God in that very same body becomes divine like God. That's a very interesting example. I, <laughs> I am not sure how a bee is able to transform a worm into a fellow bee. Perhaps any of you listening will know. You can let me know in the comments. Nonetheless, I get Sriji Maharaj's point. Sriji Maharaj then concluded by saying, The essence of this talk that I have given is that for both a person with firmness and bhakti, loving devotion, coupled with atma, self-realization, and for a person with firmness and bhakti alone, progress is as described. However, the indriyas and antakaran of a person with atma realization only, i.e., one who aspires for keval gyan, do not become divine like God's form, they attain only brahmasatta. Having spoken in this way, Sriji Maharaj said, Now let us stop this discourse, and as the assembly has become inert, someone please sing some pleasing devotional songs. Saying this, he himself sat in meditation, while the sadhus, the monks, began singing devotional songs. Wow, what a great start to this Karyani section, and I was right. <laughs> Whenever the Paramahansas gather, we're, we're in for it. <laughs> Wonderful. I hope, you, uh, I hope you understand my interpretation. Please let me know in any way I can improve my understanding as I convey this English version to you of the Bachana Amrut. Jai Swaminarayam.